Uh, as some of you may have seen already, version 4.2 of the CHT was released about a week or two ago. Um, and today, Mr. Jones and I will take you through some of those changes. But before we jump into that, recognizing that some of you might be new to the community, I just wanted to point out that uh, whenever there is a new release, we post on the forum and there'll be a link to all the release notes. So yeah, uh, before we jump into highlighting all the different changes, I just wanted to point out that whenever there is a new release, we always post on the forum um, and there'll be a link. So here we go, 4.2, about two weeks ago. Um, and there will be some of the highlights directly in the forum post, but there will also be a uh, link directly to the actual release notes. So this is the release notes directly for 4.2. Um, and you can see the complete list of all past releases directly here. So let's just pop back into 4.2. So overall, 4.2 included two new features, uh, 13 improvements to existing functionality, 21 bug fixes, and 17 technical improvements. One of the things that we wanted to mention is that we've seen a lot of great input and collaboration from community members like yourselves, not just engaging and sharing information on the forum, but actually helping find and report bugs, and in some cases, even help fixing them. So just wanted to do a quick shout out and thank you to all the community members for helping us make the CHT even better. Uh, wanted to do a quick demo of two of the user interface changes in 4.2 and one of the new features that enables health workers to learn about these changes remotely. So the user interface changes bring the CHT more closely aligned with the other Android apps that health workers might have on their phone. Two main goals of this initiative, first was to make it easier for health workers to learn how to use the app and encourage discoverability of features. And second, to make sure that the CHT uses scalable design patterns. And what I mean by that is that uh, previous versions of the CHT, we were somewhat limited to the, what features we could add because of the way things are organized on the screen. With this updated UI, we're able to add new features or screens in a much more intuitive way. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go over to the demo. There we go. So let me just back up here. So um, I'll actually start with the remote training component. Component. So in this scenario, imagine a health worker is opening their app for the first time after an upgrade that included these new inter user interface changes. So um, users can be presented with a window which alerts them that there have been important changes to their app. So I'm just gonna pretend like I'm opening my app for the first time after this upgrade. And yeah, so the users will see this window. So this is actually um, some default training content that is available to download to help you get up and running with training cards quickly and easily. All this content is totally customizable and you can turn it on or off um, as, as you wish. So in, this, in the default content that we provide, it, it, we have this um, initial card that um, basically tells them, uh, alerts them to these new changes and they can click through to see what these are all about. So um, yeah, after the initial card, they will see a card that shows them what the previous version looked like to help contextual contextualize the changes that are that are uh, that have been made to their app. Um, so this one highlights the what the action bar looks like currently in their app. And then some, um, a couple cards that show them what the updated version looks like and what they can expect in the new app. So let's see that there's the new floating action button and the actual actions are gonna look the same. And then uh, the final card is some encouragement to reach out to their supervisor if they do have any questions. And once they uh, submit this and complete the training, oops, once they complete the training, um, that card goes away. They can see the training on the reports tab if they have access to that. Otherwise, it's in the hamburger menu, um, but they can get back there. Um, so as you can, 
as we saw in the training cards, there's now a big round blue button in the bottom right hand corner. And this is actually called a floating action button. You'll see this across all the different tabs that have additive actions on them. So on the people, the reports, the messages tab, they all have the floating action button. The tasks and targets do not because there are no additive actions on there. Um, so basically, let me just click into one of these. So um, the floating action button is where users access the primary additive functions like adding new households or new household members and starting new care guides. And if we click on one of these, you'll see, for example, to register a pregnancy, we just uh, tap down the floating action button, just like we saw in the old action bar. And uh, you have a pregnancy registration here. And, and once you actually get into this, this form here, nothing else has changed. The, it's really just how you get to these forms has changed a little bit. Um, and it's the same thing with the, um, the other thing that changes where the secondary actions are. So they used to be in that bottom bar and now they are up in uh, this, um, this menu up here. So really, you know, again, if we were to go edit this, nothing else has changed with how edit works. It really just, the only thing that changed is how you actually access that. And that's really it in terms of like those two changes there. Um, it's again, it's it's really just how you access the functions. It's not the actual functions themselves. So that's a sort of quick overview of what the key user interfaces change uh, user interfaces changes are in 4.2 and a way to help train users remotely on those changes. I do want to point out that um, let's see here in the release notes, you'll see um, we have all the documentation uh, about the training cards here. But I had mentioned we provide some default content. So that's linked directly in the documentation as well. So uh, to get you up and running with the training cards quickly and easily, um, you can actually click through and grab these uh, resources and install them on your server and modify them as needed. And it gets you up and running with the training cards really quickly and easily. So I'll share some links uh, in the chat here, but you can also access them directly from the documentation site and uh, you know from the release notes side. So I'm going to give a demo for uh, the supervisor CHW create feature. So um, I am uh, have mocked up here three different screens. On the left is the online administrator. This is the person that would normally create users um, and disseminate the logins and passwords. Uh, in the middle here is the offline supervisor who has um, works with the CHWs. And on the right is an offline CHW. In this scenario, um, 4.2 gives us now the ability to provision a form and this is, of course, optional, and the form can be changed any way you want. But provision the add contact form to also create a user. So what happens is the supervisor will fill out a form. The form gets submitted to the CHT. A Sentinel transition happens on the back end, which creates a user. And then using token login links, sends an SMS to the CHW, and then the CHW We'll click the link and be automatically logged into the CHT and can start using the app right away. So this circumvents the need to go through a central authority, which some deployments may find advantageous. It is, of course, entirely optional. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate that as the supervisor. I'm going to choose an area to add a new CHW to. And um, right now we're going through the traditional add new contact. But again, this form can be customized any way you want. So we'll give the person name. And part of the flow that is important to get correct is the telephone number. Because as I mentioned, this um, 
login information will be sent via a token login link via SMS. So we'll make sure we have a valid phone number here. We failed at the valid phone number part. And select that they're a CHW. And then by submitting this, um, this is online uh, enough that it gets synchronized right away. So if we go and look at the CHD administrator and refresh the user list, we should see that there's a new user. Noticing that this is a little slow, so it might take a second here, or we might have a failed demo, in which case we can move on. I'll give it a second. Ah, great, there we are. So you can see that the Amrit user has been created and that the phone number I entered was used. And I don't have SMS actually queued up here, but we can copy the link and pretend that was received by the CHW. So the CHW would click that link and it would automatically log them in. And now they're ready to be up and use up and using the CHT. So what's important about this process again is that we've removed the need to go through a central office and automated the process um, and empowered the CHW supervisor to do this as needed. There is some implicit requirements there that I didn't mention, so I'll be explicit about mentioning them, which is that the CHW needs to have a device, may have been given to them by the supervisor, and the device needs to have the CHT installed on it. Through a question in there, um, oh, yeah. Ashley, just about what offline meant, because you had offline supervisor and offline CHW, but clearly mm -hmm. it wasn't entirely offline, so maybe that context would be helpful. Great, thanks, Mark. So. Um, in this case, uh, the because I'm using a phone emulator, it's effectively on online, online uh, and all the forms that are submitted, the CHT attempts to synchronize. But in the case where there's no connectivity, the um, process is simply queued up. So the offline supervisor would could submit the form with the CHW there. And then when the supervisor gets to connectivity, the process will be uploaded to the server, to the CHD server. The new user will be provisioned. And then as soon as the user is provisioned, an SMS is sent with a token login link to the CHT. Uh, does that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, thanks. And just clarifying that even they can work offline, but to actually get the message to go out and for them to actually log in the first time, they need to come online for that. Correct. And then they can continue offline. Cool. Yes. Are, are you and taking questions? Now, Ashley, or afterwards? We're, we'll have one more if there's if they're here. It's nice to be in context. <laughs> yeah, just just a, a quick question. Um, yeah, we've it's it's really nice to see all of the this new new features we've actually um, deployed within the last couple of days and started using. And this is one of the features that is really helpful for us. I mean, it's we were scratching our heads around you know how are we going to do this, you know, doing the two stage, creating the, you know, the CHW and then the users, and then how do you get the credentials to them and things like that. So it's, it's really good to see. Um, just a question around, so when they get that link, how long does that link last for? And do they have, is that a once off link? Do they have to then create a password and then log in via their password after that? Great, excellent question. And it adds a lot of importance around the security. The link is valid currently for 24 hours, and that's to prevent uh, a long-lived um, link that could be used at a later date should someone else get the phone. And the way it works is the it's known as a bearer token. So the payload in the link is used as a one-time lookup to allow the session to begin on the device. The password actually does not need to be set. 
it is automatically set to an unknown string that the CHW cannot know because of the way the security works. So once they click the link, they're automatically logged in. It's assumed that an administrator can just resend the link if the CHW has any problems logging in. Additionally, you can, as an administrator, revert the user from a token login process to password, and an administrator can change it back to a login and password. So the short answer is 24 hours, and the password is not known and doesn't need to be known. Right. Thanks, Ashley. That's, that answers it. And I'm super excited to hear that there's a, another deployment um, that is using this. We're always hoping our features can be impactful. So I'm glad to take a moment to recognize that that was, was helpful for folks. I see a couple more conversations in the chat. OK, great. It sounds like the stuff you're just talking about. Um, so I have two more slides that I wanted to touch on. And um, they cover four two features. The um, another feature is this ability to have additional JavaScript code be run within the CHT. There's some specific confines that this is uh, run in, and we're actually going to have a much more detailed demo. But it's a really powerful feature that we're excited to have added to enable additional features to be um, seen in the CHT. So we'll cover this in much greater detail on next month's call. Very excited about this. Oh, great. Thanks, Maria Chano. Um, this feature I was just reflecting on the other day, and it it's really amazing. Um, what we've done with 4.2 is re-architected the way first-time synchronization is done and improved it dramatically. So in this little chart, you can see that there's a number of concurrent users in the left column, a before 4.2 process timing, and a, an after 4.2 process timing. And you can see the timings go down dramatically. This is really important for users who have low connectivity and um, oftentimes take a very long time for doing initial synchronization. You should see a dramatic drop in the time for this process. This is only for first time replication. So that's the first time you log in. We are looking to make improvements for subsequent replication times, but the initial one should go down dramatically when you upgrade to 4.2. So this really could save a lot of time. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. And I, I hope that deployments can upgrade to take advantage of this change. And I, oh, we have two more slides. That's right talking about some features. So at the top of the 4.2 section, Michael had talked about showing off the release notes. But I wanted to highlight um, a few of these bugs, not because I want you all to read each one of them or I want to go over them in detail. But each one of these came from a discussion on the forum. And the forum is such a valuable part of the way we at Medic can be in touch with real world issues that users face. Um, I helped, for example, debug the second one for a user when they were um, using outbound push and were having a weird error that the remote website was saying it had an expired certificate. And we figured out that there was a bug and that we were able to come up with um, a fix around this. And this is just really important. So we wanted to highlight that each one of these came from the community. And it was an honor to fix it because we know that we're actually helping someone out there that has this problem. And on the last slide, speaking of things that we are happy to help about, um, this is the long tail of everything that was packed into 4.2. And, and Michael, again, had shown the list uh, a little bit there at the beginning on the release notes. And this is on the 4.2 release notes documentation page. But there's a lot in there. And we try to go into very accurate detail for everything that's in the release so that folks can know which of their bugs are fixed and which are not. As well, each of these on the docs page has a link to the ticket that you can dive into very detailed information about exactly what was done. All right, that's it for the 4.2 update. I'm now switching hat over to the Allies team update. 
and we wanted to give a brief update on Watchdog. Watchdog, as you may remember, is the uh, monitoring and alerting system based on open source utilities, Grafana and Prometheus. This is so that it can be free and it is easy to run using a Docker-based deployment. We're now on version 1.4.1. And the main improvements that we've added are around accuracy of alerts and um, make them more actionable. The whole point of Watchdog is to reduce the time between a CHT instance going down or having a degraded state and the CHW noticing and being unable to deliver care. Also, Allies is working on doing some purge configuration testing. We're hoping to um, enable technical partners and app developers who are pushing new purging configuration to know how big of an impact the change will be. That is, how many contacts and um, forms and reports will be purged based off of the config that they're working on. If you are running 4.2 and you would like to help test this, please get in touch with me. My email is in the chat at the top of the session. We'd love to get folks that are interested in this and interested in helping so that we can validate our solution is impactful. Actually, there was a question from one of the community members. If we can allow the token links to last more than 24 hours, and the reason for that is some CHVs can't be able to access the token links within 24 hours, so they might forget to click the token links. I believe it is currently hard coded and it could be changed. Um, I don't know if it's a configuration that is accessible to deployments. Um, I'll have to look into that and get back to folks. Um, I don't know if Diana is on the call who wrote the feature who could maybe I, jump in. Ah. It's completely hard coded. There is no configuration. Um, the admin can resend the token. So when the the user clicks the link and it's expired, they would get a message on their login page instead of being redirected to the app. So they can contact their supervisor and they can receive a fresh link. Okay, and uh, Robin, I saw that you were asking about the security after they're logged in, it is correct that then the security after the CHW is logged in will be based on whatever device security, either uh, a password or biometric on the device. And yes, you can have the administrator resend the link as many times as is needed um, so that if they need to log in again, they can. Thanks. So, so, so if the supervisor or the admin is is getting sort of a link resend requests and that ends up being fairly large in terms of volume, would that end up uh, disrupting communications between supervisor and CHW and potentially sort of access to the app? Um, having used it in a development environment, I'm not sure I could accurately say. Our hope is that the overhead of a CHW who is logged out, um, say, and unable to get logged in because they forgot their password, then they would need to get to their supervisor, who would then need to communicate to the admin, who would then need to reset the password and follow that chain back through, versus the process of logging in as the admin clicking the reset, uh, resend, uh, link, which is five second process, um, I think is going to be substantially less. So our hope is that comparatively, it's a reduction of the potential to overwhelm. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think I think it begins to. It's just you know I'm just trying to put myself in a CHW's um, headspace and think about I've sent I've sent a reset link. It's 
taking several hours for my supervisor to get back to me. I've got all of these things I need to get done today. Now, what do I do? Yeah, the I, I, I again, I think the this process should reduce that timeline uh, dramatically in terms of the time that the CHW spends offline. Um, we would love to hear from community members that find this to not be helpful to find out how we could improve it. Thank you. I will share some brief updates about the work of the ecosystem uh, focus working group. I think that two sessions ago, maybe in the April roundup call, my colleagues introduced the work around CHT interoperability. And today I'm just going to present what's new from, uh, from that uh, moment in time. Um, in a nutshell, we are working on a project that basically creates a mediator that would allow the CHT and requesting systems to communicate um, in a, under open HIM and FHIR standards. Uh, by using an, a loss to follow up workflow. That sounds maybe a bit cryptic, but we have a lot of documentation that can, can be accessed in the CHT interoper interoperability repository and a great demo from my colleagues that will explain exactly how the workflow um, is working. What's new? Uh, we have ensured that all the mediator endpoints are FHIR compliant. Basically, FHIR is a, a standard fast healthcare interoperability resources, and we are using a v4 version for that. Um, again, you'll find a lot more details about what resources from FHIR we are using for the workflow and how that's done in our documentation. So don't hesitate to go um, in our GitHub repo and read more and also test it locally if you wish. Um, also, we have started um, to build end-to-end -end tests in this repository just to ensure that new changes won't break the workflow. Um, that was also um, new from, from the last presentation. So um, we have also started a three-part blog post series on medic.org around interoperability. The first part is around what's interoperability, why is it important? The second one is really deep diving in the, into the projects that Medic has contributed to related to interoperability, and there's more to come. So stay tuned on our social media, on the forum, on our website uh, to learn more about the work uh, the team is doing there. Then another project that the uh, Focus Worker Group is working on is this, around what we call CHD Sync and a CHD Pipeline. We all know that the CHT CouchDB database was not designed for real-time analytics that, aid, that can aid, for example, a decision uh, making. So we have created these two tools that basically synchronize the data from CouchDB to a Postgres SQL database in almost real time. And it facilitates analytics on dashboards by using a tool called Superset. Um, I'm not going to go again too much into the details, but you can have, find the links to the repos there, and then you can you can uh, take a look at how that works more in detail. CHT Syncs use it log stash, uh, CouchDB search, and the Postgres tool for the data synchronization. And on the pipeline, it basically um, transforms the raw CouchDB data into more readable uh, Postgres format by using a tool called dbt. And the next slide. So what's the current status on that? Um, first, we are trying to get production ready with the first version by the end of this quarter. And we are really hoping that, these, uh, that the community would use these tools for future deployments as a robust alternative for couch to pg uh, You have also an architecture diagram there, but as we are really short on time, I'm not going to deep dive into that. But if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to try to answer those or forward them to the team uh, if I don't know the answer. Thanks. That's from Ecosystem. <laughs>